After his decisive victory at the Battle of Camden sent Horatio Gates and the remnants of the Continental Army fleeing north, Lord Cornwallis reveled in his triumph. In no time, he would finally crush this impudent rebellion and reestablish British control over these insolent colonies. As he surveyed the carnage, the conqueror came to behold the sight of a grievously wounded American officer that was propped up against a wagon. He had been shot three times and bayoneted eight times. Cornwallis personally took pity on this man, supervising his medical care. It was, however, to be in vain. Three days after he fell on the fields of Camden, this man succumbed to his wounds. But if he feared death, he did not show it. When a British officer came over to apologize for his grisly wounds, the giant man allegedly responded, I thank you, sir, for your generous sympathy, but I die the death I always prayed for, the death of a soldier fighting for the rights of man. But who was this man, this freedom fighter, who so willingly sacrificed his life for the rights of man? And did he indeed have these as his last words? His name was Johann de Kalb, and it's his story we will tell today. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. But before we begin today's video, we need to first discuss our sources. Baron de Kalb is undoubtedly the least well-documented person we've looked at so far. While it's possible to find plenty of material about him, most of it is of dubious quality. Most works about de Kalb were written in the 19th century. At that time, historians were more interested in constructing a narrative that was aligned with their own objectives, biases, and preconceptions, rather than one offering a truly unbiased and comprehensive account of the past. The story of de Kalb, a nobleman who came across the Atlantic to fight and ultimately give his life for the rights of man, fits very neatly, almost too neatly, into the myth of America, this land of freedom, individuality, and equal opportunity. Even the most recent work on DeKalb's life, the 2019 biography, DeKalb, One of the Revolutionary War's Bravest Generals, by John H. Beeks Jr., falls into this trap. As Dr. Amy Noel Ellison, an expert on early American cultural history, writes in her review of the book, Providing a fuller portrait of DeKalb, however, means revealing warts and all, and Beeks loves his subject too much for that. His primary objective is to present DeKalb as a Revolutionary War hero worth remembering for his bravery and sacrifice. Beeks rejects criticism outright from any historians who have not commanded troops themselves, and even questions the character of contemporary detractors. As this series has highlighted, we all have our flaws and imperfections. While it is not necessary to dwell on these weaknesses, it's important to recognize them. Looking at history through rose-tinted glasses and seeing only what we want to see prevents us from learning from the past. So that said, we recommend you take our story today with a healthy grain of salt. And let's begin. Baron de Kalb was born Johann Kalb on June 19, 1721, in the village of Hutterdorf, near the city of Erlangen in the Principality of Bayreuth. The Principality straddled the border between the modern-day countries of Germany and France. At the time, the Franconian Principality was part of the Holy Roman Empire. Unlike many who commanded armies in the American Revolution, de Kalb was the child of peasants. His parents were Johann Leonhard Kalb and Marguerite Seitz. Despite his humble origins, de Kalb was well-educated, attending a school in the small village of Kriegenbrunn. While at school, de Kalb learned English, French, and his native German. He left home at the age of 16. By the time he was 22, in 1743, de Kalb had moved to France and obtained a lieutenant's commission in the Lowendal Regiment 
a unit of Germans who, for one reason or another, wanted to serve in the French military. For DeKalb, we can only speculate as to his reasons. Perhaps, being the low-born son of a German peasant, he sought greater opportunities in France. Maybe he was drawn to France, the cradle of the Enlightenment ideals that he would allegedly hold so dear. At any rate, French military records clearly show a Lieutenant Jean de Kalb in French service by the year 1743. De Kalb would quickly distinguish himself in the War of the Austrian Succession and the Seven Years' War, ending the latter as a lieutenant colonel. His last formal posting was as the Assistant Quartermaster General of the Army of the Upper Rhine. With the promotion, he was awarded the Order of Military Merit by King Louis XV and made a baron. Unfortunately, that's all we know about the Kalb's military background. It seems unlikely he received a formal military education. Nonetheless, due to his long service history, he likely received ample experience in logistics, siege warfare, military discipline and organization, and irregular warfare. A decade and a half later, the Continental Army would badly need this experience. In 1764, Johann left the army and married Anna Elizabeth Emile van Robey, a wealthy textile heiress. After the marriage, Johann de Kalb became Johann van Robey, Baron de Kalb. Using his wife's fortune, he bought a chateau near Versailles, where he took up farming. The couple would go on to have three children, Ellie, Frederick, and Caroline. De Kalb briefly left his retirement in 1768. On behalf of the Duc de Chausseul, the foreign minister of France, the Baron embarked on a secret four-month-long journey through British North America. His mission was to ascertain the colonists' attitude towards Great Britain in the aftermath of the Sugar, Currency, Quartering, Stamp, Declaratory, and Townshend Acts. Were the colonists likely to rebel against England? And if that rebellion should occur, should France support it? The Baron did an excellent job on this mission, providing highly detailed reports to the French government on American dissatisfaction with British policies. It's also possible the Kalb became sympathetic to the American view. Maybe he did too good of a job. He was forced to cut his trip short after being briefly imprisoned on suspicion of spying for France, though he was ultimately released for lack of evidence. After returning home, Baron de Kalb and his beloved wife Anna settled into a peaceful life at their chateau with their children. This could have been the end of the Baron's incredible journey from a humble son of a German peasant to a respected member of the French nobility who had risen all the way to the rank of lieutenant colonel. But there was more in store for the Baron's life. Johann missed the soldier's life, whether due to his affinity for the American cause for his desire to serve as a soldier of fortune, de Kalb was introduced to the American representative in Paris, Silas Dean. Dean was only too happy to send the 55-year-old veteran across the Atlantic. The Continental Army needed all the experienced soldiers it could get. Through Dean, the Baron met the 19-year-old Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette and de Kalb were different in almost every way. While Johann came from very humble origins, Lafayette was born into one of France's most distinguished and wealthy families. Unlike de Kalb, Lafayette had received a formal military education at the prestigious Collège du Plessis. De Kalb learned, though, on the battlefield. Lafayette had never seen a day of battle in his life, while de Kalb was a veteran already of two major European wars. Lafayette was a child of the Enlightenment, who, in the American Revolution, found his cause. While de Kalb may have had some sympathies for the Americans, he fancied himself more a soldier of fortune than a social revolutionary. But Lafayette had something the Baron did not. Money and influence. Of course, the Baron was relatively wealthy, but his wealth didn't even come close to that of Lafayette who purchased the ship Victory for £112,000 to carry himself and de Kalb to the New World. Until de Kalb's death at Camden, the two men would remain close, with the Baron acting as the young Marquis' confidant and mentor. The men arrived at the port of Charlestown, South Carolina, on June 13, 1777. 
After more than a month of traveling, the two men presented themselves to the Continental Congress on July 27th. Congress, who had now become weary of these expert soldiers Silas Dean had been sending them, initially denied the Baron a general's commission, but granted one to the inexperienced but incredibly wealthy and charismatic Lafayette. Furious, this lover of the rights of man left Philadelphia to return to France. Lafayette, however, convinced Congress to grant the Kalb a commission as a major general, as Dean promised. The commission was grudgingly given on September 15th, and the Kalb turned around and came back to Philadelphia. By November 1777, the Kalb was commanding his own division. Our sources diverge on the unit's exact composition. While most sources claim it was a unit comprised of regulars from Maryland and Delaware, other sources suggest it was composed entirely of men from Massachusetts. The next three years were draining for DeKalb. He never saw a day of battle. From his arrival until mid-April 1778, DeKalb and Lafayette prepared to lead a 1778 campaign into Canada until Congress shelved it. After the Canadian expedition failed to materialize, DeKalb was given command of the American line between Elizabethtown and Amboy in the Northern Theater. Since the war in the North had mainly settled into a stalemate, little action was seen for his men. Nonetheless, the Baron did his best to keep his men ready for battle. He also suffered greatly during the winter of 1778 to 1779, saying, It is so cold that the ink freezes on my pen while I am sitting close to the fire. The roads are piled with snow until, on some places, they are elevated 12 feet above their ordinary level. After what must have seemed like an eternity to the Baron, Washington commanded him to lead his division into South Carolina in a bid to rescue Major General Benjamin Lincoln and his 5,000 strong army who were besieged in Charlestown. Despite pressing his men as hard as he could, they couldn't reach General Lincoln in time. The city surrendered to Lord Cornwallis on May 12, 1780. After Lincoln's capitulation, DeKalb was appointed second in command of the Southern Department under Major General Horatio Gates. Despite the Baron's repeated recommendation to launch an immediate attack on Cornwallis while they had the element of surprise, Gates, ever cautious, hesitated. For a month, the Continental forces waited for the order to march. Finally, Gates opted to strike the British outpost at the small village of Camden in mid-August. Unfortunately for him, Lord Cornwallis had been made aware of Gates's army on August 9th and moved to reinforce the Camden position. A position that was supposed to have under a thousand defenders was now garrisoned by over 2,200 men, led personally by their experienced commander. Before first light on August 16th, 1780, the hero of Saratoga prepared to do battle. The right flank was anchored by the Maryland Brigade and Delaware Regiment under the command of DeKalb himself. Militia units defended the left flank. This decision would prove disastrous. At the time, British military doctrine emphasized having one's strongest troops on the right flank to overwhelm and outflank the enemy. However, when General Gates chose to mirror this formation, it meant his inexperienced, ill-trained, and unprepared militia units would be facing the best British troops. The fight on that fall morning wasn't so much a battle as it was a rout. Despite outnumbering his adversary two to one, most of Gates' men, 2,500 Virginian and North Carolinian militiamen fled the field after the first shots were fired, leaving DeKalb and the regulars quickly outgunned, outnumbered, and outflanked. While DeKalb's regulars initially had some success and turned back the initial British advance, the flight of the militia left his men in an impossible situation. The Baron reacted quickly. He issued orders for the 1st Maryland Brigade to support the 2nd, but the two units could never link up due to withering enemy fire. Despite the Kalb personally leading a successful countercharge that momentarily held the British at bay, the end was inevitable. 
As the American line collapsed under the weight of a combined infantry and cavalry assault commanded by Lord Cornwallis personally, Major General DeKalb attempted again to rally his men. During the ensuing melee, he had his horse shot out from under him and was immediately set upon by charging British soldiers who shot him three times and bayoneted him eight times. It was only after his attaché, the Chevalier du Boussin, who had attempted to shield the Calb with his own body, screamed to the British troops that they were butchering a major general that the Grenadiers ceased their attacks. The mortally wounded Baron was captured, and despite Cornwallis's and his doctor's best efforts, would die on August 19th at the age of 59. He would be buried near where he died. His body would be exhumed and reburied in 1825 under a monument dedicated to his sacrifice. Construction of the memorial had started the previous year. During his 1824 grand tour of the United States, the Marquis de Lafayette personally laid the first stone for his friend and mentor's memorial. We will never truly know whether Johann de Kalb fought for ideological reasons or for wealth, glory, and prestige. In my opinion, however, he likely fought for both. If he were indeed only a soldier of fortune, he could have used his Germanic roots to join the Hessians and serve the British. He joined the Americans for a reason, yet he almost left after not being granted a commission as a major general. And while the quote we used in the introduction to this episode is almost certainly a product of 19th century romanticism, as they say, behind every legend lay some factual perchance. Even though establishing that factual perchance may be difficult, we should still always endeavor to try. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, the better-known German military commander of the American Revolution, the Inspector General of the Continental Army, Baron Friedrich von Steuben.